So hello everyone. Um, uh, my name is Stephen Bedzina, and in this presentation, we'll uh, look into the what, why, and how of uh, game-based learning. Um, we shall be looking in particular at what game-based learning is and consider some examples of games used in a learning context. We shall also be looking at why game-based learning is beneficial for the students and what are the necessary precursors for it to occur in a successful uh, way. And finally, we shall be looking at how to implement game-based learning in the classroom. So the main points for this presentation are as follows. We will start by looking at some statistics on games and gamers and explore the notion of games as a waste of time. We will then look at learning, if any, is occurring inside games and inside the game world and how this can be transferred to a more formal academic context. And we will be finishing off by exploring some good game designs and how these can act as great learning machines inside the classroom. So let's start. Um, um, I'd like to, to kick off with some numbers. So 500 million. 500 million is the number of players playing digital games for at least one hour a day. Tribillion. Tribillion is the total hours spent per week playing digital games. And that was in 2010. So today, 11 years later, that 500 million, the 500 million players playing digital games for at least one hour a day is estimated at more than 2.8 billion. So we have 2.8 billion players playing digital games for at least one hour a day. So roughly the estimated value um, from 2010 is more than five and a half times as much in just 11 years. An important um, uh, stakeholder in game-based learning is uh, Jane McGonigal, a prominent game designer in, uh, from the United States of America. And I'd like to um, uh, start by watching this video clip uh, from McGonigal um, in order to um, discuss further what her thoughts are when it comes to games and games for, for learning. So consider this really interesting statistic. It was recently published by a researcher at Carnegie Mellon University. The average young person today in a country with a strong gamer culture will have spent 10,000 hours playing online games by the age of 21. Now, 10,000 hours is a really interesting number for two reasons. First of all, for children in the United States, 10,080 hours is the exact amount of time you will spend in school from fifth grade to high school graduation if you have perfect attendance. So um, I think a very um, important point raised by Jane McGonigal here. And my reaction when first I watched this video clip as an educator years, years back was, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. These games are taking so much time from our kids from doing other important things such as studying, homework, etc. And our kids are simply playing games. And some conclusions from, from this clip from McGonigal is that for every five hours that our students are spending in class, they are spending another five hours playing video games. And that is not, not, not a joke at all. But McGonigal um, looks at all this from a slightly different, different angle. Let's, let's have a look. So we have an entire parallel track of education going on where young people are learning as much about what it takes to be a good gamer as they're learning about everything else in school. And some of you have probably read Malcolm Gladwell's new book, Outliers. So you would have heard of his theory of success, the 10,000 hours theory of success. It's based on this great cognitive science research that if we can master 10,000 hours of effortful study at anything by the age of 21, we will be virtuosos at it. We will be as good at whatever we do as the greatest people in the world. Um, and so now what we're looking at is an entire generation of young people who are virtuoso gamers. So the big question is, what exactly are gamers getting so good at? Because if we could figure that out, 
we would have a virtually unprecedented human resource on our hands. So um, the big question, what are gamers getting good at? What are these gamers learning? And more importantly, for us educators, how can we utilize this potential for teaching, learning and assessment purposes? Um, does the statement games are a waste of time is rather to be explored as a question. So are games really a waste of time? And the best way to understand games is play. We can never effectively answer the question posed by McGonagall if we never experience games firsthand. So I'd like you to think about your own experience of gameplay here. Um, have you ever played games in your life? I'm sure yes. And by games, I mean all types of games, including board games. Um, I guess most probably you would have had a go at this game called Pac-Man. Let's, let's have a short, let's uh, watch a short clip on, on Pac-Man here. Well, I think it's a very familiar um, game and a very familiar sound. And I guess all of us one, one, in one, on one instance or another have had a good uh, guess at playing this, this, this game. So here, I, I would like you to think of your own experiences of gameplay, possibly playing Pac-Man uh, some years back. Um, I've, I've did, I, I have done this exercise with, with um, some of my, my students, this little experiment. They were 13, 14 year olds, I remember. And they were all students with particularly challenging behavior. And academically speaking, they were less able when compared to, their, to, to the other cohort, to the rest of the cohort in, in that year. Um, uh, all these students were potential early school leavers. In fact, a couple of them have left formal school during that particular year, academic year. So although I was more familiar with this game, I thought these kids would have never heard of the game before, let alone level up in this game. In the slide, um, um, uh, we can see some of their points. Um, when asked to play Pac-Man for about 15 to 20 minutes, I must say that no one ever had played Pac-Man before. And as you can see, four out of five students scored above 10,000 points. So, okay, how do we interpret these scores? What does this mean? The students who had never played Pac-Man before were still managing to obtain high scores, very high scores at times. I think that this brings us to a very important conclusion. Students, irrespective of their academic abilities and background, we're learning valuable skills that could be transferred from game to game. As educators, we can appreciate that this is not common in our classrooms, especially with students who are less academically able when compared to the rest of their peers. And more importantly, I would ask myself, what are these skills? What are these valuable skills practiced in Pac-Man, which one could potentially potentially argue these are found also in good game designs. So the first skill is eye-hand coordination. And I can assure you, this is not something that one learns by simply looking at someone else playing another game. One has to experience the game in order to learn this skill. And I can assure you that I've seen lots of students playing different games, including Pac-Man for this particular experiment but I haven't improved my scores by simply looking at these students practicing and playing this game. When I was looking at one particular student with severely difficult behaviors, with, with severe behavioral difficulties playing Pac-Man, I noticed that he was stationary at one point during the game and he was standing still right there in, 
in one of these corners of the of the maze. And I told him, listen, they're going to eat you up. And he said, no, sir. The pink ghost, called Pinky, yes, because also ghosts have names, uh, will never travel as far um, as where I'm found. And I said, what are you saying? Why is, why is that? And this particular student had managed to observe what was happening inside the game and induce a set of rules, which later, after researching a bit around Pac-Man, I found were correct. For instance, the algorithm powering Pac-Man allows for different speeds of the ghosts and Pac-Man in different parts of the maze. The, for example, in the straight vertical parts of the maze, the speed increases drastically, while in other places where the ghosts definitely uh, do not go, their speed is, 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 uh, isn't, isn't, they simply don't go there. So one important conclusion from all this, this isn't found in an instruction manual. It is a very well-known fact that no gamer reads the accompanying manual of any game that he buys or she buys. So one must also appreciate the fact that for high scores in Pac-Man, one is to be attentive to every detail and to parallel process multiple elements which are inside the game world, especially in games like this, where more than one element are constantly and gradually interacting with each other. And finally, the interaction between the different elements cannot be simply understood by looking at the individual elements. In this sense, one has to integrate all these elements and see the game as one coherent co whole. So um, in order to reach these high scores, one must look at the game as a coherent whole. Okay. Um, um, we can say that students in Pac-Man, as in most uh, games, are capable of transforming randomness into order. And the last line there on that slide is very important, especially for us educators. Transforming randomness into order through the valuable skills that we have mentioned uh, in the slide. And I think this is one of the strongest points in favor of games for educational purposes. And as educators, we must maximize this potential in game-based learning approaches. So to recap, um, we have seen that students are capable of transferring skills from one group, from one game to another. And one might ask how come they are not showing such skills in this classroom? So for example, the eye-hand coordination from a game like Pac-Man being transferred to a physics laboratory. The reason is simple. This transfer, the transfer of skills from one domain to another, occurs between games, but not between, as I've said, one domain and the other, like for example, STEAM education. We can cater for uh, this by introducing commercial games in the classroom, such as famous games like World of Warcraft and make them subject of discussion amongst our, um, amongst our students. And these games are the ones which are particularly popular with our students. And I can assure you that, this, that the discussion will be particularly interesting when it comes to commercial games. However, a more practical and I guess logical option for us in our context is the inclusion of educational games or those games termed serious games where the main objective is purely educational and not for entertainment purposes. So um, some games for STEAM learning. So we have a number of games here for sciences, for technology, and also for arts and mathematics and engineering. Folded is a game related to biology and chemistry on the themes of proteins, AIDS, cancer. And um, uh, inside, inside Folded games, gamers um, uh, have managed to solve a riddle of an HIV enzyme within three weeks. And uh, this is something which real world scientists and researchers were working on for the past 10 years. So you can imagine the power of games and the motivational and, and also the uh, satisfaction in achieving such an important milestone inside the game world. Hakitsu is a coding game. It is basically a 3D robot fighting game where the players move the robot using JavaScript. And of course, this is something very ideal to introduce this programming language uh, to our students. 
Then we have NanoCrafter, which is a game where uh, one uses the DNA to build simple computer circuits. Code Compact, which is a game in which students learn to type programming languages like JavaScript, Python, and HTML, whilst they are effectively moving their characters around a maze. Then we have Redix, which is an MMOG, which means Massive Multiplayer Online Game. And it tackles common themes uh, in biology, like genetics, ecosystems, and evolution, but also other um, themes in mathematics, like algebra, geometry, statistics, and similar topics. Electric Box Squared is a puzzle, puzzle game, uh, which is basically a circuit board where players need to let current flow from the source to the target. So very, very on point for your physics um, classroom. Dragon Box is a very and highly acclaimed game for mathematics aimed at five to 18 year olds, but it also comes for older students where uh, students are solving equations in a game world, which is um, very motivating for the students and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So in summary, and as a further extension for this idea, let's have a look at this uh, short clip on four ways how to use games for learning purposes. Games in the classroom can provide a more collaborative, engaging experience for all students. According to research, games can help increase student participation, foster social and emotional learning, and motivate students to take risks. Games require players to make quick decisions in the low risk setting, which can boost their confidence to tackle learning challenges later on. To get kids to grapple with unfamiliar new perspectives, have them inhabit different personas, and then experience the impact of their choices. Or bring in games on topics the students might otherwise shy away from as a low pressure way to explore new interests. Because games are fun, students may not even realize how much they're learning. Make over a traditional lesson by crafting a compelling adventure storyline to draw kids in or gamify the lesson by weaving in game components like points, leaderboards, and badges to harness the competitive spirit. When students are researching a topic, send them on a quest, a good way to get them more hyped up than with a typical assignment. Games can increase equity in the classroom by giving every child an entry point to participate. Find games with different difficulty levels from novice to expert to increase the likelihood of all students joining in. For students who struggle to engage with traditional assignments, digital scoreboards can provide motivation. Try setting fun low stakes goals like most creative error. Multiplayer games like Minecraft and Among Us encourage players to collaborate and create strong relationships with peers. To foster camaraderie among students, assign them to rotating pairs or teams for gameplay. If you're going to integrate gaming for the first time, start small. Think about the mix of games you use and the range of emotions they can provoke. And remember, not everything needs to be gamified. So, um... Good game designs as great learning machines. As you have seen, there are multiple ways um, how one can integrate games inside the teaching, learning, and assessment uh, practices. But what makes good game designs um, as great learning machines? On the next slides, we will look at some design elements which support and enhance learning in fantastic ways. Um, the first element is the use of fish tanks. So basically a fish tank is a simplified system of a much more complex world. 
The first levels in games are fish tanks, where players are uh, facing key variables and interactions. Um, these variables and interactions wouldn't be possibly understood if they were to be immediately presented within a much more complex system inside the game world. Otherwise, um, it can be very difficult for newcomers to understand the game as a whole system if it wasn't for the presence of such fish tanks. The second point is a bottom-up well-ordered environment. The challenges or problems in games are well-ordered. What does this mean? In particular, early problems are designed to lead the players to form good guesses about how to proceed when they face harder problems later on in the game. In this sense, earlier parts of a good game design are always forward-looking to later, more difficult parts. Um, there is like a ladder of challenges, which makes the game feel pleasantly frustrating. And since the required skills in order to progress are on the outer periphery, but still within one's own regime of competence, one is not disheartened and one continues to um, try and is motivated to achieve the goals. And this is very much in line with Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Another important element is situated meaning. This um, means that the meaning of the different components is situated in the actions of these components. So the instructions of the game make little sense if one tries to simply read them before having actually played the game. All one gets is lots of words, lots of technicalities that might be confusing and have rather general meaning, mean, meanings and which are eventually quickly forgotten if not practiced and experienced firsthand inside the game. Um, uh, during and after playing the game, the instructions are clear and logical because every word has a meaning related to an action in a context. So games which are simply played without reading any manual, they still can be, be understood because the actions inside the game work are happening inside the context. So the players can still make sense of what is happening. Feedback. Feedback plays a vital role in a game like this, but in all games. Immediate uh, verbal performance feedback is given at all times and multiple level goals exist in the form of scorekeeping and speeded responses in very good game designs. And as we have already said, this gives a tangible sign of progress to the player inside the game world. An interesting aspect of feedback in games is that the variable information existing in games is hidden and presented both on demand, so tutorials can be skipped, and also just in time by hovering over the available components or by clicking the level hint um, button in some games. Another important element is progress. Unfortunately, some games do not allow multiple ways of progress, especially games designed for educational purposes. They present a linear and unique trajectory, both inside and between the levels. In fact, each level has a single victory state. And I think this is this lack of customization does not allow different styles of learning and play and are rather limiting to the individual achievement of the individual players. Adaptivity. Adaptivity is another very important element in games. Um, uh, I would suggest to steer away from games for learning in which the overall level of difficulty is either an easy or a difficult mode which is something that is hard-coded inside the game and cannot be chosen. Also, I'd suggest to not choose games which do not adjust to the skills of the individual player or no randomness occurs inside the game world. Why is this so? Um, in general, this limits the, um, the, uh, the, the flexibility inside the game world and leads the player 
and players to memorize staged consequences rather than to actually experiencing and investigating the game world. Consequently, this discourages thinking and critical reflection and evaluation. And um, it is a simple um, uh, try again game where you are simply guessing uh, things rather than actually experience, experiencing them um, according to your level of expertise. The last element is failure. Failure is my favorite. In games, players need to fail. In fact, every time that a player fails, he or she is getting closer to the goal of the game. In reality, players are learning to fail better each time inside the game world. And this is something that we must learn for our educational endeavors, but also, I guess, in life. So when implementing a game-based approach to learning with our students in our own classrooms, what do we need to keep in mind? The first question that I get is, is it simply playing a game? And the answer is quite straightforward. No, it is not about simply playing a game. Let's, what, let's watch this uh, short clip to introduce the idea of implementation of game-based learning inside the classroom. Managing gameplay is just like managing other learning activities in your classroom. You'll know you're on the right track when you see your students helping each other, having fun, and reflecting on what they're learning. Sparky first. Good, good. So, how do you manage gameplay? Step one, think about how you manage your classroom. A game isn't some sort of special zone where anything goes. Before using a game, Think about rules and procedures you already have in your classroom. Leverage those to manage gameplay. For example, what are your rules for cleaning up after an activity? Review those rules with your students and apply them here. Step two, everyone plays a role. Depending on the type of game you're using, you may want to create student roles. One role may be a material manager who hands out, organizes, and collects game pieces. Other roles could be a timekeeper, note taker, or scorekeeper. Step one, be a facilitator, not a firefighter. Even if the answer to a question is a simple yes or no, guide your students to discover the answer on their own. And if several students have the same question, stop gameplay and have a quick class discussion about that question. Step two, iterate and improvise. If there's a common concern that develops, go ahead and make changes to the game right then and there. Who knows, you might create a unique game that opens up new learning for your students. Step three, be a cheerleader. Support students in their learning through gameplay. Keep an eye out for great moves or successful strategies that occur and share them with the class. Step four, wrap it up. Plan ahead for the possibility that your students might not fully finish the game by the end of the class. So make sure you're clear on how you return to the game. Gather feedback. For example, ask your students what they learned from the game, what they liked and disliked, and what they might change about the game. Thanks for watching. Now go ahead and try it in your classroom. Next, to learn how to assess student learning during and after gameplay, check out the video on game assessment. So Edutopia, um, a number of um, uh, important um, contributions to game-based learning. If you simply search Edutopia and write game-based learning on YouTube, there are a number of important videos that can uh, um, help you in your game-based learning endeavors inside your classroom. Um, my experience of implementing game-based learning in my classroom. So um, my experience of implementation um, is, is rather about the construction of a learning package. So a learning package that surrounds gameplay. And as I've already said, it is not simply just about getting students motivated and having fun learning by simply dropping a game and then moving on with your uh, normal teaching um, endeavors. So 
A learning package which surrounds gameplay is crucial if we want to implement game-based learning in a successful way inside our classroom. So what is uh, inside a game-based learning package? I would, I would um, uh, say that there are three main elements in such a package, a game-based learning package. First of all, it's about an introduction. It's about actually playing the game and a minor note here, play the games that you choose beforehand, never go in class unprepared without having played the game beforehand yourselves because you will be um, surprised of what can happen. And also a final debriefing activity, which will help wrap up as uh, we have seen in the video. But why do we need all this? Um, it's about something that we have already mentioned in this uh, presentation. It's about the transfer of knowledge. Research and literature say that the transfer of knowledge between games and other domains of life, including um, academia and including educational contexts, is far from automatic. And it's very far from automatic, I can assure you. So we cannot simply say that by having students playing a game, they will automatically show those skills and that knowledge inside our traditional classroom um, uh, working for, or for instance, homework or classwork. So we need a significant reflective and conscious practice to mobilize such information. And um, the three elements that I have described earlier are very important in achieving such a mobilization of information, this transfer of knowledge from one domain to another domain. So let's start with the introduction. Why an introduction? Introduction is simply setting the scene for what's coming next, all right? The introduction should always be brief and to the point. And remember, Gamers don't read manuals, do not give long texts of information and instructions. You should just explain the purpose of the activity and give some basic information on the game. Because remember that not all our students are gamers, so we need to also think about those students who might feel uneasy with playing games. Then gameplay, and this is the time when we should leave our students become the, see the next superheroes and save the world from the next meltdown. Your role is a role of facilitating the transfer of knowledge, remember. So give ample space and time for students to experience gameplay, to experience the game, and to go through all the quests inside the game. Then comes the interesting part, the debriefing activity. That is something that normally we miss when doing game-based learning activities, but it is a key aspect of a successful implementation of games inside our classroom. So the debriefing activity um, has one main purpose. It is to link the game to the academic content in order to facilitate the transfer of knowledge. So as you are seeing, it's all about the mobilization of this, this knowledge, this information, this transfer of knowledge from the game inside the uh, insight or towards the um, uh, more traditional academic life. Three simple academic activities. The first one, um, the talk allowed walkthrough. So these debriefing activities are, um, I have experienced them in my own teaching um, career and I think they are good ways how to mobilize this information. So the first um, debriefing activity, the talk aloud walkthrough, is basically having one student playing the game in front of the whole class. So as you can see in the picture, the little student over there is playing and actually choosing the elements of the game in order to achieve a better score in front of the whole students. As she is um, playing the game, she is giving reasons for the moves and the choices, and me as a teacher, I would facilitate the whole class discussion that would go on when having such a talk allowed walkthrough. Of course, there will be lots of chit chat between the students, 
your role as a teacher is to have a constructive criticism of what the student is doing by giving alternative um, answers, by giving alternative ways of solving puzzles, etc., etc., etc. Another option is the reporting option. To you, this might look like a traditional report from a physics experiment, true. But this um, report is a debriefing activity that occurred after playing this game. Okay, so the only difference is that it is not based on a real life experiment with a real circuit board, bulbs, etc., 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 but it is based on the game Electric Box Squirt, which is a, phys a physics puzzle game uh, on electric current. So, through reporting their experience of gameplay, students will be moving in and out of the game and thinking about their decisions, the decisions and the actions they chose to take inside the game world. The third option is the create and share option. It is basically um, uh, the idea of having students creating um, uh, different levels. Um, and then these students will be basically allowing other players to uh, play this game and of course find different solutions to the game and I think this is a fantastic way to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and to allow collaboration and cognitive development for our students. So that was all from my end. I thank you for watching. Feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much.